annual fuel cell electric bus webinar series 2024. We have a great lineup of three webinars occurring over the next month. The next uh, webinar will take place March 28th, and it's going to feature fuel cell bus training and support with Kirk Conrad from SARTA and some of our technicians here at Ballard. So we encourage everybody to take part in that. Throughout this, this webinar today, we encourage everybody to submit their question and answer and we'll address as many as we can online. We're going to go live right at one o'clock. And today we've got Tim Sassian and Michael McDonald from New Flyer. And uh, Tim's going to lead us through the presentation from Ballard and myself, and then Michael will take it over and we'll wrap it up with the question and answer uh, period. Uh, the webinar three that we're going to be offering is taking place on Thursday, April 11th, and that's going to be on grants and funding, and we're looking forward to seeing everybody in that webinar. Today, we have 462 people registered, a whopping increase from last year. So hopefully the acceptance of fuel cell electric buses is on the upswing. And we're all here for the same purpose, and that's for fuel cell electric bus deployments. Uh, again, we're going to take go live at 1 o'clock and start our webinar series. So we're just watching everybody come in now, and we're just a couple minutes away from beginning. The Federal Transit Emission announced the opportunity for $1.10 billion in competitive grants um, in the fiscal year 2024. And we're offering this webinar series as an information package for people that are thinking or deploying fuel cell electric buses and in infrastructure to support the fuel cell electric buses. Here at Ballard, we have a great in-house team full of technical capacity and capability. So feel free to reach out to Tim and I. Are in, our contacts are going to be listed at the end, along with Michael McDonald's. And uh, we greatly encourage everybody to reach out um, that's considering an application. We'd love to work with you throughout the process. Hello, I'm Kim Leach. I'm with Ballard Power Systems and today I'd like to talk to everybody about the fundamentals of fuel cell electric bus deployments with my co-host uh, Tim Sassian. Tim is the Market Development Director and Public Relations for North America and myself, I'm Kim Leach. I'm the Market Development Manager for North America and Canada specifically with an interest in the eastern United States. And one of our presenters today is Michael McDonald from New Flyer. So uh, can we kick off the, the marketing presentation now? Next slide. Hi, um, I'm Kim Leach. Uh, I'm the Market Development Manager, and I'm going to moderate the, the session today. I've got Tim Sassian, Market Development Director for Ballard, zero, um, and he's going to talk about the zero emission adoption and total cost operating costs, and Michael McDonald, who's the Operation Manager for New Flyer. So hi, Michael, and welcome aboard. On to the next part of the presentation, please. And Please feel free, my, my information and contact information is going to be listed at the end. I encourage everybody to reach out after the, the, the webinar today and submit your question and answers throughout the, the webinar. We will respond to as many live as we can, but we will definitely respond to you after the webinar if we don't get to those questions. So who is Ballard? Ballard has an extensive history in fuel cell technology development dating back over 44 years, there's one gigawatt of fuel cell products shipped to date, one gigawatt of MEA production capacity, 3,600 plus buses and trucks operating globally. That's that's astounding. 170 fuel cell buses on the road in the US and Canada, 98% of uptime of fuel cell modules in transit buses and 25,000 hour product lifetime proven in operation. Uh, rigorous technology and product development process is in-house at Ballard and our quality assurance is top notch. Um, so 125,000 miles. So what is the fundamentals of a fuel cell? Unit cells combine to convert hydrogen and oxygen into electricity for power with water and heat as product, um, the, as heat is a byproduct and zero emission. So the fuel cell stack through to the fuel cell engine and to the powertrain powers the bus. Tim, the next slide. 
We have 30 years plus experience in the transit industry producing modules to support uh, transit buses. The proof of concept for the Olympics um, in Vancouver, that was one of the best Olympics Canada ever hosted from 1991 to 1995. Then the hybrid fleets from 2000 to 2004, 2009 to 2014, when we all love to go back to those years and commercialization today um, with our partnership with New Flyer. A hydrogen bus is an electric bus. They have the same electric drivetrain as a battery electric bus. Some the same maintenance and parts, including fuel cell power module and gas tanks. Um, there's zero emission, really high efficiency, electric drive, and low noise. And that's so appreciated when you're downtown in a city and a bus goes by and you stop and you pause and you appreciate that moment and what it actually feels like to have that technology readily around us. The low infrastructure costs, fast fueling, increased passenger capacity, and I think that's what top mind for everybody with long range and extreme weather tolerance. Next slide, please. Zero emission bus comparisons. It does promote uh, positive driver behavior, fuel cell buses, also shorter refueling times, get the turnaround quicker, social acceptance and knowledge and perception. as our zero emission mandates improve and increase marketing and, and discussions around, you know, the, the dinner table or, you know, council room, the social acceptance and knowledge and perception of having a fuel cell electric bus or a zero emission bus is top of mind. Increased range of 550 kilometers, 350 miles, challenging terrain and cold weather performance, hills, valleys, flat streets, it, it performs well. Less impact, less impact on schedule time and resources. In today's world where it's hard to obtain and maintain staff, um, take in mind less scheduling requirements. There are auxiliary heaters and accessories. That's a really hot topic for increased um, temperature in the cabins and with fuel cell electric bus, that isn't an issue. Next slide, please. Today, there's multiple offerings for fuel cell electric buses. We have more than 20 years of road experience that's being offered, over 8 million miles in service. The fuel cell module availability at 98%, more than 25,000 hours of staff durability. There's buses deployed in over 70 cities globally with a stronghold being in Europe and 125 million miles on road experience with heavy duty vehicles. Next slide, please. So there's a picture of what it looks like worldwide for fuel cell bus deployment, 1,753 buses. And we're seeing uh, deployments increasing and the interest level growing rapidly. So the fuel cell electric, sorry, the FC Move platform, it's a compact, innovative design, low life cycle cost, engine bay and flat configurations for easy integration, high performance, robust product and wide operating range with a 70 kilowatt to 100 kilowatt version and 1 million, kilom 1 million kilometer product warranty. So sorry, 1 million kilometer product warranty. So I'm gonna hand it off to Tim, take a bit of a break. We've got Tim Sassi and he's the Director of Market Development and Government Policy for Ballard Power Systems. It's all yours, Tim. Hey, thanks, Kim. I really appreciate it. Um, speaking of FC Move, this is the full product line. So this is the evolution of being on the road for over, you know, almost three decades. The FC Move line starts at 45 kilowatts, and we're going to be looking towards deployments for shuttle buses and some of those smaller light duty commercial applications. The core FC Move products there, the second one is our 70 kilowatt, and then we've got our 100 kilowatt modules in two different configurations. And what's really exciting is the XD module as well coming up for the Class 8 trucks, and look for those coming into motor coaches very soon. So we cover uh, what we figure is the best spectrum for medium and heavy duty. And it all starts with transit and expands outward, but transit is really the workhorse. And the FC Move HD Plus module is key for that. It uses our LCS stack to provide 100 kilowatts of power. We've got both the engine bay configuration there shown in the cubic form and the rooftop or uh, elongated module 
shown next to it. We're using those not only in transit buses, but also in commuter trains, medium duty trucks, other applications as well. It's enhanced packaging. Everything is inside of one box. We've shrunk down about 30% in our volume and our weight uh, and cost as well. It really is an evolution from uh, the last generation of fuel cell buses that are on the road. And we support these. We support these with our not only our integration programs, we work very closely with our partners, New Flyer in particular, which we're about to hear a lot about, uh, to get those systems really optimized for the powertrain and then taking care of our customers afterwards. Our customers know us. They know us very well because we get in close and we understand their operations to the best of our ability. We make sure their people can get capable and comfortable with these buses. Customer care is why Ballard has been around for 45 years. And here's where we're going to. We're expanding in the United States. Last year, we saw production up and underway for the FC Move modules out of Bend, Oregon. As that facility expands, the great Nate McCrosty there uh, running that facility you can see on the left-hand picture, and then just announced today our award for uh, the federal DOE money. We're uh, investing $160 million of our own dollars in addition to these $40 million in Rockwall, Texas. We're building a gigafactory, folks. We're making lots and lots of fuel cells in the Lone Star State. Uh, Ballard is highly committed to the North American markets, and we are fully Buy America compliant now and moving forward in the future. Kim, back to you. Thank you, Tim. Uh, our OE I'm proud to introduce our OEM partner, New Flyer. In February 2017, Ballard committed to provide 20 fuel cell engines to New Flyer for the 40-foot zero emission bus, then an increase again in June uh, 2021, a following order. In September 2022, uh, mid unveiled the Excel surcharge with fuel cell engine provided by Ballard. And as Tim, if we can move on to the next slide. So here today is Michael McDonald. He's going to fill you in far better than I can. <laughs> He's the operations manager at New Flyer. It's all yours, Mike. Awesome. Thanks so much for that intro, uh, uh, Kim and Tim. Uh, really great to be here. Uh, happy to always be here talking about fuel cell buses and talking hydrogen and the expansion and development of the hydrogen economy, um, especially you know, looking at the kind of information that Tim disseminated about the fuel cell. Obviously, the technology is very, very important, uh, but equally, if not more important, especially coming from my perspective, is how we take all of those technologies uh, uh, together and put them on and integrate them into a bus uh, to get out there and actually uh, meet service. So that's what I'm going to be talking uh, about today. I'm going to focus a little bit about the, the technology and the bus integration and also talk about some bigger picture stuff, a little bit on infrastructure um, and how we can help you meet uh, your zero emission transition plans. Uh, a little bit about me. Uh, I've been uh, with NFI Group for now almost seven years in a, in a number of different roles. I'm currently overseeing our Vehicle Innovation Center, which frankly does a whole bunch of different things. But one of the main reasons why I'm joining you today is because one of our goals is to help educate customers and stakeholders specifically on the technology itself uh, and in particular the zero emission uh, technologies to help decision makers um, drive uh, or make informed uh, decisions for their uh, zero emission uh, transition plans. So a little bit uh, about uh, uh, New Flyer and NFI. New Flyer is the transit bus business in this greater um, global company that we call uh, NFI Group that includes uh, New Flyer, the transit bus business, MCI, our motor coach business. And we also have a, uh, a smaller and medium duty ve uh, vehicle uh, provider in Arbok, as well as uh, our friends at Alexander Dennis, uh, who truly really make us a global company based out there in the UK, primarily making uh, double deckers as well as, um, as single decks uh, as well. And as you can see on the screen there, many, many years of experience uh, just on the New Flyer and MCI side. Um, we go back to the 1930s. So we've been around the block. We've uh, we've kind of done it all, especially as it relates to propulsion. And of course, we're going to be focusing on our fuel cell bus history here and how we got to a, uh, a real tremendous product that we're very proud of here offered in, uh, uh, in uh, North America. And if you are North America based, we are your fuel cell bus uh, manufacturer. So 
Starting here with the product that we have today that I'm going to be focusing on. This is our Excelsior Charge FC. We're very proud to launch this product back uh, in the fall of 2022. As you can see from the pretty pictures at the bottom of your screen there, we offer this in a 40 foot and a 60 foot uh, uh, configuration with the uh, the Arctic there, the, the, the dual uh, cars. Uh, what's cool about this is in addition to the, uh, the the technology that we have listed there towards the right of uh, your screen that I'll, I'll get a little bit more granular with, um, this is all built on our common Excelsior platform. We released this back in 2010. We've literally put well over uh, a billion miles of revenue service on this platform. And so as far as the structure is concerned, we really feel like we hit it out of the park with this. It's been tried, tested and true. And as we explore lowering emissions with different propulsion systems, both going to, to low and zero emissions, we found uh, that it was our best approach to, to be building these propulsion systems on that same common platform. So it isn't a, a ground up reinvention of the wheel here. We have something that's proven here to meet transit's number one priority uh, which is, of course, uh, reliability. So, uh, and I, I feel like most folks in the audience probably uh, understand this uh, a little bit about why we would be even interested in, in pursuing hydrogen uh, as an alternative energy source in our zero emission transition plans for transit. I think most are familiar with the fact that we get uh, uh, more kilowatt hours, so we get that extended range. Of course, it's a zero emissions uh, solution and the fast refill uh, times and the, uh, the the avoiding of, uh, of complex and, and high power consuming and frankly slower uh, uh, chargers for, say, battery electric. But there's also a number of different um, uh, benefits as well. Uh, we have uh, uh, infrastructure that becomes very economically uh, attractive uh, uh, at scale. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. As Kim mentioned, this is still an electric bus, and so you still get the wonderful benefits of an electric drivetrain, so you get that smoother and more responsive acceleration. Of course, it, it operates quietly, uh, and you get uh, the regenerative braking as well. So all of those exact same benefits. And then if you're in a, uh, a colder climate, uh, certainly this is a big uh, concern, is the free heat that you get. Even though a fuel cell is far more efficient than an, an internal combustion engine, you still it is still a, a chemical reaction, so there are still some inherent inefficiencies. Those are good for us. If we're in a winter setting, we can actually capture that, and New Flyers uh, uh, spent a lot of time on, on trying to efficiently harvest that waste heat, dump it back into the cabin, so we're relying far less on an electric heating system and, and using that hydrogen just to heat space rather than for traction. And I, I would say that probably this is all, you know, kind of culminates in that final bullet point there that it forms like a diesel. So, you know, if you're if you're operating a, a, a transit agency, you're, you know, you're very set in your ways. It's a very big beast. It is a complex system. And so these sort of, you know, more disruptive um, uh, alternatives, I might say, uh, you know, can be very, uh, you know, less welcome by this industry. And I, I would go as far as saying that I think that most transit agencies would say, hey, I understand uh, why going zero emissions uh, is important. I fully buy into it, but I can't completely uproot my entire operation and start from scratch. And so hydrogen and, and, and the fuel cell buses lets you basically operate your fleet essentially as is, just like a diesel without having to completely reinvent the wheel there. So a little bit uh, about our history, and this is really just a, a small snapshot, but I really wanted to illustrate here that uh, this isn't a science experiment. These fuel cell buses are rolling off uh, uh, an, uh, an assembly line. These are production buses. And back in the day, they were a science experiment. Back in the early 90s, um, you know, partnering with our friends at Ballard, you know, going back to, you know, now 30 years, three decades um, of learning exactly how to integrate these complex systems onto a bus and make it run. Plenty of lessons learned here, plenty of scars that we're proud of. But Looking back at the late 2010s when we released our, our latest and greatest, with, uh, which was a far more modern version of a fuel cell electric bus, uh, bringing that to 60 foot. And then, like I said, uh, just uh, at the end of 2022, releasing Excelsior Charge FC. And you can see the numbers at the bottom there. No kind of poultry. It's small. Um, it was at the time, I would say, even just several years ago, kind of a, a niche product that was limited to places like uh, like California. And we're a little bit more on the purpose built side now completely changed. And I realize I don't have um, updated numbers there. Those are just showing deployments or, or deliveries and not interest or, or, or orders placed. But uh, rest assured, that number is dramatically climbing. Uh, I, I saw that the study that was just released um, uh, a little while ago that showed the interest um, uh, or the orders place is 75% year over year from the, the previous year. And I wouldn't be surprised if uh, if in early 2025, we 
find that in 2024, it was 75% or more year over year that previous number. So we are definitely getting to the blade of that hockey curve stick. And uh, it's an exciting time to be working in hydrogen, especially uh, that uh, in transit too. So a little bit about the energy flow uh, here, and this kind of you know gives you a, a very high level snapshot of how we get energy from hydrogen. So on the top row there, this is not going to look that much uh, different than um, a traditional chemical fuel like diesel or especially CNG. Obviously, there's production someplace. Um, it has to be uh, located at your site. So you've got some on-site storage. You've got a dispensing system to get the fuel on your bus, and then you've got uh, some sort of fuel tanks uh, on board there. I think that that part is pretty straightforward. Um, now, uh, looking sort of towards the, the bottom left quadrant there, you'll see batteries and, and, and motors and everything else that seems to be very common uh, to maybe a battery electric vehicle, and that's that's because it is. So in parallel, as we've been developing and evolving and innovating uh, our fuel cell electric buses, we've been doing the same thing with battery electric buses as well. And there's a lot of common systems there. So a lot of those lessons learned that we have with battery electric have been fully translatable to the fuel cell electric buses. And then the, the, the big difference there, as you look between CNG or diesel and battery electric, is that wonderful looking black box uh, down there that Tim and Kim were talking about. That's that's the heart of the whole system. That's the fuel cell. That's how we take a stored chemical fuel and then through some sort of magic, <laughs> transport it or tra uh, tra uh, tra uh, transform it um, into electricity. So whereas in a, an internal combustion engine, you'd be taking a chemical fuel, you combust it, you basically you make it explode, you use that heat and pressure that you create to drive pistons to then um, drive a, a drive shaft and, or, or drive an alternator to run the, the hotel load or the, uh, uh, or the traction system. Uh, here, instead of uh, creating uh, uh, thermal energy, we're creating the electric energy and basically the rest of it runs just like a standard EV. So uh, definitely a big part of the lessons learned for us, uh, and, and again, in parallel as we explored and, and, and evolved our battery electric model was kind of understanding these you know, quote unquote newer zero emissions technology. So understanding where a fuel cell best plays or where batteries best play. And uh, it was definitely found that within the transit space, transit is a super unique um, duty cycle and a very unique sector to work in because uh, on, on one hand, you have you know the start stop. Um, you know, you, you you take a big heavy bus, you have to accelerate it up to speed and then immediately slow down just a couple of blocks away. So this is a very high power application. But at the same time, those buses are expected to be working from early morning to very late at night. So in that sense, uh, in this in the sector, we would call it a little bit more towards an energy type application, something like a class eight truck. So the challenge for us and, and certainly the lessons learned in the field were how do we best balance the capabilities that we get from batteries and the capabilities that we get from fuel cells? And so we kind of arrived at this what we think is an optimal type of design where we get the best of both worlds. So here we have a, a relatively large battery, especially compared to some other uh, fuel cell electric vehicle architectures. Um, it's and it's uh, in our latest and greatest 140 kilowatt hours, which isn't that much energy if you're used to thinking battery electric bus, but is a lot in the fuel cell space. And then a fuel cell in the background that's kind of viewed a little bit more like a, a battery charger running in the background and ultimately providing all the energy to the bus and giving us that best balance between power uh, and the start stop uh, and energy to be able to run that bus as much as you need. So what's new between Charge FC and our previous generations? Well, uh, the, the vast majority of it, you know, uh, aside from some uh, some pretty uh, um, uh, uh, interesting innovations as it goes with uh, uh, integrating different components on the bus and moving things around and making it run more efficiently and get a higher performance, it's a technology that's going on the market right now. So as transportation uh, technology gets better, we have more technology that we can take advantage of and better integrate it onto our bus. So uh, really, that comes down to four main ones um, shown on the screen here. Uh, obviously, the fuel cell being a, a very major part of it. And that's uh, FC Move, like Tim talked about, uh, where we get a significant boost in power, which helps for higher speed applications. Uh, you know, I mentioned start stop being a big part of the duty cycle and transit, but at the exact same time, there are plenty of examples out there of buses that are expected to maintain highway speed for periods of time. Uh, and having uh, a little bit more power uh, behind it to recharge the battery system is uh, has been important. Same thing with pulling grade. But I'd say 
uh, that uh, some that probably some of the most prominent improvements to the fuel cell technology from Ballard is its serviceability uh, and its uh, smaller footprint. So you get that higher power density, which allows us to take components, more strategically locate them within the body of the bus and make room for other components uh, and uh, enhance uh, the overall performance. And then the rest of the uh, of the enhancements are consistent with our battery electric bus evolution. So better batteries, better battery packaging, and the propulsion systems. Um, you know the, uh, the the battery uh, on our, our sorry on our architecture is uh, you know plays a a pretty major role. It has meaningful kil uh, kilowatt hours that actually contribute to the overall range of the bus. And so as energy density gets uh, better. Um, uh, for heavy duty batteries, we get to take advantage of that and add to our range in that way. And our ESS packaging, our energy storage system, the, the, the batteries, we've evolved that to a composite system here. So we're lightweighting it, we're simplifying it, we're making it uh, more serviceable. And while that might, might not be the, the sexiest uh, component, it's something that has been uh, a tremendous improvement for the simple um, uh, buildability of these bus and the serviceability, like I uh, had mentioned, uh, being a, a sort of a, a common sort of layout, which helps us build better buses. And then uh, lastly there, a more powerful, more consolidated, less complex, um, propulsion system uh, uh, that is also next generation. So uh, I wanted to show you this slide over here to give you a little bit of an idea of the layout of all these different technologies, how we take them together and integrate them onto the bodies uh, of our bus. So we're showing there both the 60 foot and the 40 foot there. Uh, just like with the battery electric bus, uh, we take advantage of the space that we have on the roof. So as you can see there, we've got the tank array. We've got two strings uh, of high power battery cells uh, on the roof, uh, a couple other subsystems, and then the fuel cell uh, engine itself uh, located where we would have a traditional uh, internal combustion engine in the back there. With that 60 foot, you'll also notice a couple of differences uh, in addition to an additional uh, HVAC unit on the roof there to complement the one uh, in the rear, uh, that 60 foot cabin is very, very uh, high volume. And so in 110 degree uh, weather, we need a supplemental HVAC system. And probably equally, if not more important, is the offerings for traction. So, you know, it's one thing to have a great energy storage system, but, you know, what's the performance like? And in addition to being uh, or into offering two different types of motors, one being sort of a standard and the other one being uh, a higher torque motor for grade climbing, we also offer uh, a center driven axle that has built in in hub motors. So that allows a, a portal axle, which means that the whole thing is still low floor, but you get that extra boost of power on that front car there, which is something we don't even have in our diesel buses. So real big advantage for traction in uh, avoiding jackknifing uh, and fishtailing, uh, especially in uh, sleek conditions. Uh, a little bit on hydrogen safety here. Obviously, safety is a uh, top concern, and I don't have time to go through all the major systems here, but I just wanted to give you a little bit of a uh, of an idea of our general approach in terms of the, uh, the, the, the types of sensors that we use to detect not just fire, not just gas, but also impact. So we've got sort of a, a triple threat there that we account for. And we have a, a pretty long path where we have to take hydrogen fuel and bring it down to the fuel cell system. Uh, so uh, what we have is a, a, a real nice isolation approach here where we have those three methods of detecting an issue and then also being able to action those uh, and isolate any problem that we might have uh, on board. So plenty more to do with that, but I just wanted to give you a little bit of flavor of, uh, of how we approach safety. So uh, that that's the bus side of it. Of course, infrastructure is, you know, arguably an even more important part of this. How do we get hydrogen? How do we make it? How do we store it? How do we dispense it? And I just wanted to give a little bit of plug uh, of a plug for uh, a, another business that we set up a, a, couple, uh, a number of years ago called Infrastructure Solutions, where as we look to transition to a zero emissions future, we realize as a bus builder that we can't just be a bus builder anymore. And we have to think of ourselves as more of a full suite um, mobility solutions provider. And so we set up a business to, 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 to deal in this area. Um, in the early days, it was all based on battery electric. And so we got plenty of experience managing very different um, uh, construction uh, projects, procuring chargers and doing all of the civil on site to get that infrastructure built up. We are uh, well into getting um, uh, plans uh, uh, aligned for bringing this exact same expertise as hydrogen takes off in the transit industry and, and take that expertise and expand upon it, build those strategic partnerships. And, and I'll say for anybody in the audience that is a 
hydrogen provider or wanting to get in the game, we're very happy to uh, to have you on board and and try to work towards establishing those strategic relationships so we can work together uh, for customer satisfaction. So a little bit more on infrastructure, again, uh, just towards the left, that gives you a little bit of a flavor of exactly how we work, the different areas. It's everything you see there or piecemeal. Some uh, uh, some uh, customers will have uh, different needs or different areas where they'd like us to help play. And then on the right of your screen, just giving you an idea of some of the, the major componentry that's uh, involved. And this all depends if you are procuring um, hydrogen on the open market, whether that's gaseous or liquid, or you're producing it yourself. Um, you know, there are examples out there of installing renewables and actually producing your own electricity, then producing your own hydrogen, and then the rest is actually pretty common, getting it to a common pressure uh, with a compressor system, and then keeping it uh, in its gaseous state uh, and close to a state where it's uh, it meets standards to be uh, dispensable onto the bus. And then uh, also, again, fitting in with being a full mobility solutions provider, we have our NFI uh, Connect system, which is this really wonderful data-driven and constantly evolving product offering, which is actually an array of many different smaller uh, products that are all brought together with this whole central idea of data. So we're living in this very data-driven society right now where we have these high-tech instruments all kind of working in silos on the vehicle itself. And the, the whole idea behind Connect is that we're bringing together all this data here, we're filtering out what's not important and we're giving you what is important to help you use data to better drive decision making um, both at the bus level and at the fleet level. So we've got that technology there and it really fits nicely with the zero emissions propulsion technology. Uh, workforce development is obviously a big piece here, and this is actually a little bit of a plug for uh, the the, uh, the the next webinar series that Ballard is hosting, as Kim had mentioned. But I just want to talk a little bit about how uh, uh, NFI plays in, in workforce development. We've got uh, three plus different programs that we offer, um, one of them being through our New Flyer Institute, which is more on the technician and maintenance personnel training side. So the wrench turning, boots on the ground. How do we fix this? How do we maintain uh, our fuel cell electric buses? Then we've got the Vehicle Innovation Center, which I manage, which is for, uh, uh, for leadership and decision makers at transit agencies needing to better understand exactly what this technology is and what it can do. And we also offer uh, an online learning management system as well, which is uh, you know, really effective for the flexibility factor. And I will say that workforce development is a big part of the low no uh, grants and, and the low no program. I know many of you on the line probably right now are thinking about low no, and that's why you're here to, to learn a little bit more. Uh, so uh, with the low no, 5% of, uh, of your application does need to be geared towards workforce development. So just wanted to give a plug that we are very cognizant of that and we have the horses to help you through that part of it. And then uh, I'm almost done here, but I just wanted to finish on a final note, just on some insights, having been involved in fuel cell bus deployment for a long time, and just give you some tidbits of uh, uh, of advice or strategy. So first of all, just like uh, uh, maybe you did with uh, in the early days of battery electric and just sort of exploring uh, zero emission buses, very much the same approach when it comes to fuel cell electric um, in having what I would say a, a manageable type of approach. Um, so whether you are buying your very first fuel cell bus or you have done it and you're looking to scale, do, doing so in a manageable way. And if that involves just doing one and treating it like that science experiment, that's perfectly fine. But I would say that definitely, you know, using tools like NFI Connect um, and, you know, keeping a close eye on exactly how those buses are performing and what you need them to do, use that to inform your scaling strategy and always keep scale at top of mind. Same thing goes for infrastructure there. You know, whether you're buying it or you're producing it, try to always uh, make sure that the final design of your infrastructure is always built um, to grow. Um, so this will save you a lot of money and a lot of headache in the past, and you can treat it uh, as if it's going to be this constantly growing uh, part of your fleet. And then lastly, uh, on leveraging your existing expertise. I said already that um, you know you can think of the fuel cell bus as being sort of the marriage of existing technologies. So you know uh, diesel, CNG uh, being married uh, with a battery electric drivetrain, and so that's that's entirely true. So if you have uh, battery electric buses and or uh, CNG or diesel buses, you already have some training uh, and personnel that's well equipped. You already have some tooling that's well equipped and some facilities. It's really just about uh, taking the next step there. And if you have one or two of, um, uh, of these already in house, then you're already halfway there. And then this is my last slide here. Just wanted to give one last plug for our, our very good friends at Ballard. We're very, very 
proud of this long and important partnerships that we uh, that we've had with them. Uh, I bragged about how long uh, NFI uh, companies have been around the space and how we have the staying power. This isn't always the case, especially with zero emissions um, uh, technology providers. You know, startups come and go, but Ballard has really shown that they had the, sta the, the staying power. They have uh, the uh, the background. They have the personnel to support their product all the way through, not just sell you um, the, the system and then walk away from it. Uh, they they demonstrated their staying power and their uh, their reliability there and that's why we've chosen to partner with them for so long and we're looking forward to a an even more expanded uh relationship going uh forward into the future so with that i'll uh sign off here well I'll, I'll stick around for the rest obviously happy to take any questions please reach out to the vehicle innovation center or to myself directly very happy to continue the conversation uh and build out the hydrogen economy with uh, fuel cell electric buses so thank you Thank you, Michael. It's absolutely wonderful working with the new flyer team. I really, every time I talk to one of the sales reps or yourself or anybody in the upper management stream, it's it's always been a pleasure and definitely, definitely a great partnership moving forward. So the cold weather fuel cell performance, as, as we wrap up here, um, it's commercially available today with competitive total cost of operation costs. Uh, fuel cell electric buses can meet winter challenge winter challenges for people that are considering it in the northern United States or up in Canada. Um, fuel cell electric buses complement the electric bus fleet, strong ecosystem in place. Um, and honestly, fuel cell electric buses will pave the way for other heavy duty applications such as truck, marine and rail. So um, just on to the next slide there, Tim. I'd like to... Uh, talk to you further about who your support team is. Again, it's myself. If you could reach out to me, our our, uh, our contact's going to be listed at the end of the, of the webinar. We work with Sydney Kruger. She's our sales representative for Ballard Power Systems and President Kruger, uh, Kruger Transit Consulting. Her and Henry are out in the field working every day with partners in the transit industry and ed. And then Tim, who's really a master and a genius in, in the hydrogen industry and the market development director for Ballard. Tim, next slide, please. Yeah, thanks, Kim. Um, really appreciate that. And it is great working with Sydney. If you know fuel cell buses, you probably know Sydney. She is a foremost expert on fuel cell bus commercial deployments within transit. Um, and, you know, transit really has a lot of questions to answer because they're at the first point of the decarbonization effort. And one of those questions is what is the full life cycle uh, carbon signature? of these vehicles you know it's more than just the fuel it's also the embedded energy that goes into actually creating these things and all the products that go into them and what do you do at the end of life at ballard we look at that full value chain we benefit from the natural build of the fuel cell that is uh plates and membranes and it's easy to disassemble it's easy to separate those materials and recover valuable things like platinum that's our important material for the catalyst. And we get about 95% of that back. We reuse our plates and our, our total energy for life cycle emissions is well below a quarter of that of what you would see for a battery electric bus when you look at all of those components. Our deployments are expanding. This is where we're at today. In fact, it's changing day by day as these buses get into the field. We're actually up to 175 fuel cell electric buses deployed across the United States. As mentioned earlier, a lot of those started in California from the money that they devoted towards those efforts, but we're expanding outside of that. Ohio has been uh, in the fuel cell bus club for a very long time, as has Champaign-Urbana for a few years now. Flint, Michigan also a big supporter of fuel cell electric buses, expanding their fleet. And we're up in the north, up in Edmonton and expanding out into Washington. And now we see a huge growth potential, another at least 250 more buses that are already funded, that are either on order with new flyer or the funding has been secured and they're just waiting to per place that PO. We see a lot of activity across the Midwest, our old industrial sector getting very keen on hydrogen, but also all across the United States and Canada starting to get interested in getting their zero emissions compatible with their operations. And LONO has been a huge part of that. The FTA has funded a lot of this effort, particularly outside of California, although California has done very well in winning awards for fuel cell electric buses. Uh, all these states that you see here have won awards for hydrogen and fuel cell electric buses. New York doing very well. Also South Carolina, Illinois, Hawaii, 
uh, $23 million re uh, awarded for low no efforts for hydrogen and fuel cells. Maryland and Del Delaware doing well. New York, huge efforts there. And we expect to see a lot of new entrants coming on very soon. For those who want to see a third party assessment, one very good resource is what uh, the folks in Oakland, California at AC Transit have done. They've worked with Stanford University on their deployment. They've got over 33 fuel cell electric buses in their fleet. They've been a long time runner of several different manufacturers and generations of fuel cell electric buses. And they've compared them against diesel, diesel hybrid, battery electric, and looked at the very critical performance parameters. And I encourage you to look at all four volumes of this. A summary is coming out soon. But you can see we compare very favorably to diesel hybrids uh, doing better actually for operating costs and cost per mile, particularly when you look at the incentives available, but even without still doing very well for availability and maintenance costs per, per mile and comparing very well even to battery electric and to diesel. Uh, please do check that out. We're showing that we can perform in the field. Foothill Transit Agency made a very large purchase uh, just a little over a year and a half ago for their 30 plus fuel cell electric buses. Uh, they have over 359 buses that cover a very wide area of the LA basin. They have a high utilization rate and they need to have their operations be compatible with what they do today. They're limited in space, they're limited in time and manpower. And they, they are finding that fuel cell electric buses have the promise to keep their operations as solid as they've been while getting rid of their emissions. Out in the east, in Philadelphia, Southeastern Pennsylvania Transportation Agency, SEPTA has stepped into fuel cells big time. Uh, I encourage you to look at their journey into fuel cell electric buses. They did an extensive study of what it would mean to go fully decarbonize with battery electric and what it would mean to do it with fuel cell electric. And fuel cell electric was capable, whereas they were challenged to meet that with battery electric. So we're looking forward to their fleets getting deployed. In fact, uh, the big Zebcon event that CTE puts on is gonna be out in Philadelphia this year. That'll be quite cool. Uh, Champagne Nirvana, big advocates of hydrogen and fuel cell, big pioneers. They've got their own electrolysis facility. They make their own hydrogen from their own renewables. They are as green as green gets. Uh, Carl Gannat, very knowledgeable about the technology uh, and one of our demanding and also uh, most insightful customers. Really happy to have Champagne Urbana continuing to expand their fleet. The total cost of ownership of fuel cell electric buses is something that needs to be considered. We're within, eh, let's say, 10 to 12 percent price for equivalent battery electric buses. But when you look at total cost of ownership, there are a lot of other factors that come in. One of those is how many buses you have to buy because we have range equivalency for most of what diesel and CNG needs to do. You buy the same number of fuel cell electric buses, battery electric buses, you'll need a few more. That's a cost. But another big cost is fueling infrastructure, which I'll talk about in a second. You can have a huge savings from fueling infrastructure compared to charging infrastructure for big depots. In this case, this is really a 20 bus assessment. So even fleets as small as that can see a cost advantage when you have the right conditions that favor a fuel cell electric bus. Uh, midlife rebuild costs also an advantage. They looked at about an assessed 20% savings uh, of doing those buses as fuel cell electric buses compared to doing them with battery electric. Here's one big reason. Um, shout out to Jamie Levin at CTE once again for this enduring graph. Uh, this adds a few little bit of color to it. On the left side, you see this graph that shows how the costs for your infrastructure change as your fleet size increase. Uh, you've got a nice green arc there for fuel cell electric bus showing it coming down, but the blue arc shows it increasing as you go up in fleet size. When you start off with battery electric buses, one of the great things about battery electric buses is it's easy to start small. You can buy the buses and just a couple of charges with your electrical infrastructure and not much expense beyond that. But when you start looking at full depot transitions, 50 buses, 100 buses, you have to start upsizing your electrical infrastructure and that can be costly. Uh, things like site transformers are not only expensive, they're difficult to get. We know that they're in short supply, anybody who's looked into it. And as you go up in size, you'll need to increase from a couple of megawatts up to say 10 megawatts. And now your feeder and your substation are starting to need upgrades and you're getting in to utility scale infrastructure that has to be expanded at the same time that everybody else is decarbonizing as well. So you'll be competing against uh, trucking fleets and other industrial uses of electricity into that interconnection queue. Hydrogen has the advantage that you are independent. You have control over your fuel 
uh, equipment and supply. You start off with a significant investment for some large infrastructure, such as the, the cryo tanks, uh, or if you're making your own for the electrolyzer, uh, you'll need vaporizers for liquid, and you'll need compressors in any case. But as you go up in size, the amount of equipment that you have to add as you add on buses gets smaller and smaller. Once you've made those initial investments, expanding your fleet gets less and less expensive. And that gives fuel cell electric buses a strong advantage for infrastructure as you get into fleets of hundreds of buses. Uh, something like one fifth to even one tenth of the cost uh, we've seen in, in recent assessments. And a big reason of the interest in hydrogen and fuel cells is concern over the grid. Uh, we need the grid in hydrogen and fuel cells just like battery electric does, but not as much. We have auxiliary components and we can keep running even when the grid goes down through fuel cell electric power generators uh, and delivery of the fuel. What's the problem with renewables today? We could have enough to decarbonize our grid by 2035, but they're all backlogged. Uh, we've got 95% of what we need, but we can't get them on the grid. And we know we need to grid, grow the grid substantially and quickly, uh, very soon, to meet all of these needs. Hydrogen can do that. Hydrogen helps the grid to expand. It supplements it. And in fact, when you look at it, two infrastructures truly are cheaper than one. The federal government gets it. Secretary Jennifer Granholm gets it. They put a lot of money in the hydrogen hubs and into the IRA tax incentives, which are watching very closely for the final guidance on that. They are still shooting for $1 per kilogram of hydrogen production costs. You'll add on a couple bucks of that for your commercial costs uh, by 2030. And as soon as we get that IRA tax incentive settled out, I think you'll see a lot of these projects getting underway and finally see the movement uh, for cost decrease for zero carbon hydrogen that we've all been looking for. Kim? So the performance of fuel cell electric buses powered by Ballard, 25,000 hours of proven life service, fuel cell module availability remaining to 97% throughout the lifetime. Uh, current maintenance cost in around 48 cents a mile, the uh, 16 cents and environmental conditions operation from minus 40 to plus 50 degrees and free start minus 25. And like I said previously, we've seen up to 31 minus 31, which is quite cold. We, we don't like that weather, but it's, it's realistic that it's still out there. So on to the next slide, please, Tim. So I'm proud to announce that we're going to do this again on March 28th. We're going to be talking about electric bus training and support. We have Kirk Conrad from SARTA. Uh, Kevin as well is going to join us, and that's taking place on March 28th. Our third webinar series is going to take place on April 11th, and that's going to be funding and, and resource support for uh, fuel cell electric bus deployments. There's been a few questions come in, quite a few questions actually, which we'll address. Uh, we encourage everybody to continue to send those questions in. Uh, between the three of us, we're going to respond to those questions. and. There is going to be resources circulated at the end of the webinar for everybody, and there's going to be a really great piece. It's, it's a white paper on fueling infrastructure. That's Ballard's. It's on Ballard's website, and there's also other case studies there if, if you want to continue to research information. So again, our contacts are here. Great webinar today. Great to have you on board again, Mike, and talk to you again tomorrow. We've got another meeting tomorrow, so it's going to be great to see everybody. And Tim, make sure you reach out to us. And Sydney's also there as a resource. So thank you from Ballard to everybody attended. We had 462 people registered. and We've maintained a great attendance here today. So remember, that deadline is the 25th of April. We encourage everybody to go after a fuel cell electric bus fleet. Thank you from Ballard. Tim, Mike, thank you again. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.